Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the global arms trade and how the wars affect the global arms trade, including the war in Ukraine, but not just that war. We'll also talk about the war in Yemen and others. My guest for this conversation is Andrew Feinstein. Andrew Feinstein is the founding director of Shadow World Investigations. He is the author of the books, The Shadow World, which is about the global arms trade, and also After the Party, which was a detailed account of his time as an ANC parliament member in South Africa and how he was forced out after he uh, uncovered an arms deal scandal. He's also the writer of the 2016 documentary film called The Shadow World. He joins me from London. Andrew Feinstein, it is a great pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this radio program. Great to be with you again, Mitch. Your book, Shadow World, uh, published some 10 years ago or so. I remember we had you in our radio station in Berkeley to talk about it. Uh, It was a conversation that was very popular among our listenerships, and the book showed how war is big business, how arms and weapons big business, and how also the big business of weapons fuels war in turn and also corruption. Let, let's begin with what's happening in Ukraine, in the war in Ukraine. How does this narrative that you tell about the role that the arms business plays in the world, how does Ukraine fit into this narrative? Which of course, there, there are many conflicts that are a consequence of various geopolitical factors, various fairly local, regional factors. But the work that I've done over the last 20 years or so suggests that we should also look at the economic motivations for war. So if we look at the situation in Ukraine at the moment, we're talking about a conflict between two countries that are led by two men who are extremely wealthy. Um, the president of the Ukraine was discovered in, in one of the big leaks of um, banking information and, and offshore banking data um, to have well over a billion dollars stashed away. Um, the president of, of Russia, um, I wrote about in the shadow world as having probably accumulated somewhere around $40 billion then. It's probably stratospherically more than that now. And a fair percentage of that would come from their, his cut of, of arms deals. So whenever there is a conflict, the reality is that a lot of the people who are at the forefront of that conflict are benefiting materially financially and sometimes politically as well. So, you know, it's one of the reasons why the world is so often seen through what C. Wright Mills described as a, as a militarist mindset, where the way to resolve difficulties is through conflict, is through war. And that's reflected probably more than any other statistic that I know of by the reality that the U.S. government, for instance, which produces 40% of the world's weapons, employs more people to run one aircraft carrier than it does diplomats across the entire world. And the United States of America today has 11 aircraft carriers with a 12th being commissioned. So when we look at something like the conflict in Ukraine, which which is so tragic for so many ordinary people in the Ukraine itself in the first instance, but also in Russia, those people who are opposed to the war, who have been courageous enough to stand up for peace. Um, When we look at how these people suffer, we shouldn't forget that the big defense contractors, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Raytheon, are seeing their share prices skyrocket as a consequence of this conflict. And in fact, the chief executive of Raytheon just a few weeks before the invasion of Ukraine spoke about the fact that the instability in the Middle East, referring specifically to Yemen, the instability in Eastern Europe, referring specifically to the situation in Ukraine, are great for the company and its shareholders. So whenever there is conflict, whenever there are people suffering, there are often politicians, military leaders, and those who benefit from them, the intermediaries, plus the big weapons makers around the world who are doing great business out of all of this. What do we know about weapon makers of the world and, and the business in this in these last, I, I may, maybe even into the lead up to the war in Ukraine? 
Well, I think we know two things. We know that on average, and, and this estimate is now a couple of weeks out of date, so it's probably conservative. But we know that on average, the big defense companies around the world, um, their share prices have increased by, on average, 26% since the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. We have also seen calls in almost every Western country for significantly increased defense budgets. And that always means more money for weapons. So we have definitely already seen an uptick and informally, I mean, I can't base this on statistics, but informally, just in terms of the sort of intermediaries I speak to, the so-called arms dealers, arms brokers, or arms agents, depending on the roles they fulfill, I mean, they're talking about being busier than they've been in a long time. Who, who are they? Who, who, what do you mean when you say arm, arms brokers, arms dealers, these people you talk so, to? The, the, okay, so... If we were to define these people formally, they would be the people who bring the deals together. And these would be not only the sort of deals that we think about when we think of a film like The Lord of War, the sort of more illicit side of the deal where, you know, it, it's not necessarily a legal transaction, the sort of Victor Boots of this world, if you will. Um, but that's a bit of a misnomer because the reality is that the biggest arms deals between the world's biggest countries always have elements of illegality in them and always have these intermediaries involved. So, you know, when the United States of America is doing a deal with Saudi Arabia, there are arms dealers or brokers or agents involved. And what do these people do? Well, you know, and they're not, you know, the victor boots are the sort of the exceptions, the, the adventurers who we imagine flying into conflicts with sort of cargo planes full of errant weapons. These are very sophisticated members of the establishment, usually incredibly wealthy people. And what do they do? Well, they know the influential power brokers, both on, say, the American and the Saudi side. They, they know who needs to be paid what in terms of bribes, because an arms deal with Saudi Arabia doesn't happen without bribes. It's the mechanism by which the Saudi royal family move money from the state treasury into a variety of offshore accounts, which is how they build up the sort of personal wealth that they do and how they maintain it. But even on the American side, um, there is something that is referred to as the feedback principle. So, you know, when, when a Lockheed Martin is paying massive bribes on a deal in Saudi Arabia, Senior executives from those companies get what we call feedback from those bribes. And this is the compensation they get for taking the legal risk of approving these bribes. And as Pierce Spray, the, the sadly recently departed, brilliant former aerospace design engineer from the Pentagon, um, who has been highly critical of American militarism for decades. I mean, he says, you know, when, when somebody joins one of these companies, Initially, they're not thinking about the bribes, but after they've done their first deal with a country like Saudi Arabia, and they realize that they can make more out of the feedback on these bribes in one deal that they'll make in years and years in terms of salary and bonus, then they land up scouring the world looking for people to bribe. So these are the intermediaries who put these deals together. But we shouldn't forget that there are huge institutions that also act as intermediaries, the world's biggest banks, the world's biggest law firms, the world's biggest consulting firms. They all play a part on these deals. And most of what they do is they obfuscate the flows of money in both directions on these deals. But then to complicate it even further, Mitch, and I'm sorry to have to do this, we should not forget that the biggest arms dealers on the planet are the heads of our government. So the person sat in the White House, the person sat in 10 Downing Street, the person sat in the Kremlin, the person sat in the Elysee Par Palace in, in Paris, in the Chancellery in Berlin, because it is ultimately our heads of government who are actually responsible for buying and selling more weaponry than anyone else. So of recent times, the United States has provided $2 billion worth 
of arms and military aid, whatever that means to Ukraine. I guess just reading that, people assume, okay, Congress approved this in a spending measure, or maybe even the president just came with his own order, provided the funds for these spent for this spending, uh, and then sent these weapons to Ukraine. It, it, it's not as simple as that. Well, it's not. I mean, how it's supposed to work in theory, which doesn't mean this is always how it works in practice, but the executive is supposed to inform Congress when an arms sale um, is imminent. And Congress then has a short period of time in which to push back against the arms sale if it wants to. That happens very, very seldom in the U.S. Congress. Um, if they do push back, the president then just has to wait a short period of time after that, and he can veto their resistance to the arms deal. So the bottom line is, if the president of the United States wants to export weapons to another country, he can do so. And there is a degree of transparency in that process, but there is a very, very limited scope for actually stopping these arms deals. And it's why the United States of America continues to arm Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in a way that is absolutely crucial to the continuation of the war in Yemen. And if we think about the fact that um, on just this past Saturday marked the seventh year of the war in Yemen involving the Saudi and UAE-led coalition, in which it's estimated 377,000 people have been killed, over 20,000 innocent civilians have died, the vast majority where we have the conflict in Ukraine that's been going on for a month, and it's an awful conflict. We've seen what has happened to some of these people, some of these families, to some of these towns and cities and villages. But that's been going on in an even more intensive way, in an even more profound way in Yemen for seven years now. And the country is laid to waste. 14 million Yemenis are dependent every day on some form of aid to survive, and there is very little aid going into the country because the UAE has effectively blockaded the country by sea and Saudi has blockaded it by air. So we have the world's worst humanitarian crisis that has go been going on for seven years. And the reality is in that crisis, there's an, e there's an easier resolution to it than there appears to be in, in the Ukraine-Russian crisis at the moment. Because if the UK and the United States of America simply stopped exporting weapons to Saudi and UAE tomorrow, within a couple of weeks, the conflict in Yemen would come to an end. So this is a conflict that we could directly stop, that we are directly responsible for ensuring is continuing in this most appalling way that it is every single day. And our governments are enabling and facilitating that, and our defense contractors are making tens of billions of dollars out of that. Do you find a contradiction in the amount of attention you, the war in Ukraine gets compared to this war in Yemen? Absolutely. I don't for one moment in any way regret any of the attention focused on the war in Ukraine, because I think that common humanity demands that we show empathy and support for those people who've been attacked and invaded. But at the same time, I find it remarkably hypocritical that a conflict that we are far more directly involved in hasn't garnered a fraction of that attention. And it's almost as though people in the Middle East, in Yemen, are somehow different to people in the Ukraine, that you know, their, their blood is of a different nature, that their suffering is of a different nature. And of course, this is nonsense, that we need to show the same levels of empathy, the same levels of concern, the same levels of outrage, and make the same demands of our governments to end the conflict in Yemen as we do the conflict in, in Ukraine. There were efforts in the United States Congress to curb the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia that could be used in Yemen. Did, did, did that not succeed? 
No, not at all. So at, at one point, there were quite a few, well, quite a few. There was a, a vocal minority of people in Congress, in both houses actually, who were pushing for a curtailment of weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. And Joe Biden, as a candidate, said very explicitly and repeatedly that he would ensure through influence on Saudi Arabia that the conflict in Yemen would end. And he intimated during the campaign that he would cease sales to Saudi Arabia if it did not. As president, he's done nothing of the sort. As far as we can gather, he's put no pressure on Saudi Arabia and arms sales have continued at the alarming rate that they were occurring um, under the Obama administration and under the Trump administration, under Biden. What's the U.S. interest in supporting Saudi Arabia militarily like this in Yemen? What, what's, I guess, the, does the U.S. have interest in Yemen, or is this just to appease an ally in the Middle East that provides a lot of oil? So I think that that is, is the first port of call. The reality is that we've identified Saudi Arabia, despite it being one of the worst human rights abusers on the planet, despite it being one of the most misogynistic, homophobic um, societies on the planet. We have decided that Saudi Arabia, a country whose very founding, we as the United States of America were very involved in, we've decided that they are one of our primary allies in the Middle East, and that's primarily because of the amount of oil um, that they have and how dependent on that oil we are. But in addition to which, we have decided to, to really place our um, diplomatic eggs, if you will, into a basket that comprises informally Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Israel. And together with them and a number of Western countries, our objective ultimately seems to be regime change in Iran. From the Saudi and UAE side, they want to be the top dogs in the Middle East. And Iran is really the only obstacle to that. So because some of the Houthi militias involved in the Yemen conflict are supplied with arms on a fairly small scale by Iran, it is in some ways a proxy war against Iran. But I think there's another objective, and that is that Saudi Arabia has, um, on a number of occasions in its history, decided that it would rather lay waste to, to Yemen than enable Yemen to thrive as a country that might not be beholden to Saudi Arabia and thus to the United States of America. And I think it's for those geopolitical reasons um, that we have supported Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in, in this indefensible conflict in Yemen, in addition to which we shouldn't forget um, that further back historically, Yemen was divided into North and South Yemen. And so one of the Yemens was, was actually a socialist country. Um, and that gave the United States of America sufficient reason to have issue with Yemen. Um, and the fact that it has really driven that concern with sort of half of, of the Yemen political process, if you will, through a proxy like Saudi Arabia, I think simply shows us that it's not really in the interests of democracy, freedom, human rights, or territorial integrity that the United States of America is is involved in Yemen, but in fact is undermining all of those things and is simply trying to consolidate the United States' sphere of influence in the Middle East through Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and indirectly Israel. And I think what that sort of intervention has done, certainly since the Second World War, has actually made the Middle East the most febrile, the most conflicted region on the planet. And an enormous amount of that is down to the intervention of the United States and its allies. Is, is part of the dynamic here and continued U.S. support 
for Saudi Arabia's war militarily, so for selling arms to Saudi Arabia for its war in Yemen, is that U.S. defense contractors are making money off of it? Is it something that there's, contributes? There is no doubt that that is a factor. And I, and I think, you know, what my work has attempted to do over many years now is to put those economic, <clears throat> excuse me, is to put those economics at the forefront of any discussion of the American or the European arms trade, because I don't think we can really understand them without understanding those dynamics. So the first thing to say is that American defense contractors sell the majority of their weapons to the Pentagon, unsurprisingly. But then the export sales outside of the United States of America bring down the cost per unit of whatever the United States defense contractors are producing. So it means that the Pentagon can actually buy this equipment for cheaper from American defense contractors if they have a healthy export market. So that's one motivation. It's the cheaper for the United States. It's cheaper. I just want to underscore what you just said there. It's cheaper for the United States to buy weapons if there's a bunch of other countries also buying weapons at a higher price. Absolutely. So, so let me give you an example just to make that absolutely clear. The F-35, um, known to some as the trillion-dollar turkey, because about a year ago, even a United States inspector general concluded that the main brains of the F-35, the most expensive weapons system in the history of the world, even the brain of the F-35 jet fighter is not fit for purpose. And basically, they have to start again. So this is a this is a jet that has cost the U.S. taxpayer well over one and a half trillion dollars so far, and it's still not working properly. But 24, 25 other countries have bought the F-35, the F not because it's a great piece of machinery, it's nothing of the sort, but because it's a way to solidify their political and military alliance with the United States of America. Now, the reality is the unit cost of every F-35 bought by the U.S. military, if there was no other country buying the F-35, would be significantly higher than it is with the 24 or 25 other countries also buying this jet. And it's, it's, it's like anything. You know, if, if you're going to buy a Lamborghini motor vehicle, there are probably, I don't know, maybe 50 Lamborghinis sold in the United States in any given year. If there were 50,000 of them being sold, it would be a lot cheaper to buy yours than if there were 50. The same applies to weaponry. And the reason this is so crucial when it comes to U.S. defense contractors is that these are very badly run companies, first of all, that many of them, without the level of state support that they get for marketing, for research and development, and various other forms of subsidies, probably none of them would actually be in profit. So bringing down the cost of the equipment to the Pentagon is also allied with the objective of ensuring that these defense contractors survive. So they are probably in the capitalist system that the United States has, there is no other industry that is as subsidized, as supported by the public sector, by the taxpayer of the United States of America, as the defense sector, as the arms making sector. So that's the one motivation that is really important for why we want to continue selling these weapons into conflicts like Yemen to Saudi Arabia, even though we are complicit in the commission of war crimes that are taking place in Yemen, as I outlined. But there's another very important reason. We need to keep these companies in business because they are a very important part of our national defense and national security. But at the same time, as Lawrence Wilkerson, former chief of staff to, um, Colin Powell. to General Colin Powell says, um, there is what, what he describes as a global national security elite, senior politicians, senior military leaders, the senior executives from these companies, senior intelligence officials. They all benefit personally and materially from the trade in weapons. How does that work? Well, for the politicians, sometimes, and you know, 
my book is replete with examples of politicians who've basically been bribed by defense contractors. And those bribes sometimes are personal, sometimes in the form of benefits and gifts. Sometimes it's campaign contributions. And we see how those politicians get themselves onto the relevant appropriation committees and they ensure that the companies providing them with money for their political careers and personally sometimes are getting tens of billions of dollars worth of contracts back. I mean, you could just state. you could just look at the House and Senate Armed Services Committees and look at the lawmakers who serve on those committees and see where their funds come from. I mean, that's exactly as you described. Absolutely, mm -hmm. the most consistent, biggest contributors to political campaigns have been the defense companies for decades and decades and decades, long before the banks were spending the amount of money they do today. Um, on lobbying long before the pharmaceutical companies were doing what they now do as a matter of rote. These companies have been doing it for decades and decades. And it was, I think, if I remember correctly, um, Lyndon Johnson, who at one point was described as the senator from KBR, so bought was he by that particular defense company. K Kellogg, so, you know, Kellogg not, Brown and Root, which was instrumental exactly, in the Vietnam War exactly. and also in, in its... its it's uh, it would give birth. I think it was Brown and Root. Maybe later on, I'm, I'm it's all top top of my right. head. But I think Brown and Root was then. So Kellogg Brown and excuse me, Kellogg Brown and Root was instrumental in Vietnam. Uh, Brown and Root was it was instrumental in Iraq. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And of course, who was the ultimate chief executive of the company that had bought what was initially Brown and Root? but none other than a certain vice president by the name of Dick Cheney, who happened to also champion the invasion of Iraq. So there are all these sorts of um, financial connections, but they go beyond even that. Let me explain a bit further. When a general leaves the Pentagon, in 84% of cases, their next stop isn't retirement. Their next stop is one of the defense contractors. And they get a huge signing on bonus and they earn a very large senior executive salary. That, in effect, is payment for all of, all of the contracts and support that they gave to the defense contractor while they were working in the Pentagon. So, you know, the revolving door is not a new concept by, by any means. And it has been spinning wildly for decades and decades in the United States of America. But I would argue that probably over the last 20 or so years, it is spinning completely out of control. And so to maintain the level of money that is circulating amongst this global national security elite, you do need enemies and you do need conflicts. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Andrew Feinstein. He's the founding director of Shadow World Investigations, which follows the money with arms deals. He's also the author of such books as The Shadow World and After the Party. I should also add, you're, you're, a, tra you're, you're a trained economist as well. <laughs> so I was of a generation of white South Africans growing up under a party where to avoid serving in the apartheid military, I had to study endlessly. So I have degrees in clinical psychology and in economics and finance. Um, so, yes, amongst other things, I'm a trained economist. I, I want to come back to the two billion dollars that the United States has sent to Ukraine. And in fact, if you look globally, which I'm sure you have, it's not just the United States that is sending weapons to Ukraine. Even Germany, which is significant, has sent weapons to Ukraine. Obviously, Ukraine is being attacked militarily by another country a lot of people who are listening to this some people who are listening to this will say um yes what's happening inside of saudi arabia and u.s support of that for that is is a very bad thing is, is obviously negative outcomes but ukraine is under attack by a much stronger military force this is different what would you say to that well i think there are two things to say mitch i think the first thing is to say that we could have done a lot more to try and find a diplomatic solution to the situation in the Ukraine. Um, there were certain indicators, for instance, the continued expansion of NATO ever eastwards and the threats 
by Ukraine itself and by um, some of its allies in the West, including the United States, that it was being considered for NATO membership. This came after the reality that in 89-90, the leadership of NATO gave an undertaking to Russia that NATO would not expand eastwards. Of course, we've seen that expansion with a variety of countries in Eastern Europe. In fact, the US even had a committee to expand NATO, which you'll be shocked to hear was chaired by a senior vice president of Lockheed Martin. And he would travel around Eastern Europe, Poland being the one case that I've written a great deal about. He would meet with Polish military and government officials and he would say, I can guarantee that the United States of America will support your membership of NATO on condition that the X billion dollars of weaponry that you will need to buy as part of your accession to NATO because you have to modernize your um, defense forces as long as those billions are spent with Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed, for instance, out of Poland, made in excess of $20 billion when Poland acceded to NATO. Um, And I think we now see a situation where President Zelensky is saying Ukraine will remain neutral, et cetera, et cetera. Six, eight weeks ago, a number of political leaders were saying that Ukraine must become a member of NATO. And Putin was pushing back against that. I'm not saying that that was Putin's primary reason for invading Ukraine by any means. I also think that the situations in the in the two regions where there are a lot of Russian speakers um, and where there has been a quest for greater autonomy hasn't been particularly well handled. So I think there are two obvious, very major diplomatic areas where there could have been far more progress made by our own governments and the Ukrainian and Russian governments. But at the same time, Vladimir Putin is not what I would describe as a reasonable leader. And I would argue that part of his motivation for invading Ukraine has to do with his own domestic political difficulties. So it's not just about the expansion of NATO. It's not just about the two regions in which there are many Russian speakers living. It's also about the precariousness of Putin's popularity in Russia as it goes through something of an economic crisis. He's certainly not as popular as he has been in the past. And as we know from our own politicians, there is nothing better for a politician than a war. Because a politician can then, first of all, present themselves as the ultimate patriot, the ultimate nationalist, and as a great war leader. And I think that was certainly a part of Putin's calculation. So now we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the best way to bring about peace as quickly as possible? You may argue that it is to give the Ukraine additional weaponry, additional support that is going to make it more and more difficult for the Russians in their illegal invasion of Ukraine. And that is what is going to bring them to the peace table sooner rather than later. There are others who argue that actually by pouring weapons into a conflict, the only thing you are going to ensure is that more people are going to die in that conflict. And it's a very, very difficult balance. And in this situation, Mitch, I have to admit to you that I do not know enough about the situation on the ground to be able to say which is likely to be the most successful option that will lead to peace. And I should say to you that even though I do this work on the global arms trade, um, it surprises people sometimes when I admit that I'm actually not a pacifist. I, my mother was a Holocaust survivor who lost dozens of her members of her family in the death camps of mainly Auschwitz um, and to a lesser extent Theresienstadt. And I do think that if I had been alive at that point in Austria, as my mother was, or in Nazi Germany, I would have probably taken up arms against Hitler. And I do understand that there are times in in which weapons are needed and are sometimes necessary to bring about peace in a situation of conflict. I do not know, I cannot say hand on heart, that I know which is the best option for Ukraine at the moment. But I do believe that we are probably not doing as much diplomatically as we could be 
to bring about an end to that conflict. But Mitch, one thing I can say to you is I know enough about the situation on the ground in Yemen because I'm actually writing a book and making a film about Yemen and the arms trade at the moment to tell you that if the United States and the United Kingdom stopped all arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, technical experts suggest it would take a matter of a couple of weeks before they would start running out of the spare parts, the bombs, the missiles that they need to continue that military operation that is killing tens of thousands of innocent civilians. And the arms trade is not like a grocery store. If they don't have one kind of apples, you can always buy another kind and eat those. They won't be identical. But when it comes to weapons, if you're using American and British jet fighters and bombers, as the Saudis are, you can't simply start putting French or German or Chinese or Russian bombs and missiles into those jet fighters. You can't simply get a spare part for a Typhoon jet from the French because they don't make them. So it takes you many, many years to rebuild your military infrastructure. So in the case of Yemen, I can give you a definitive answer. In the case of Ukraine, I can't. I can understand the need for people to be armed to defend themselves. But I am also concerned that more arms into an area of conflict are likely to make that conflict more bloody and to ensure that it lasts for longer. But we have to do in the Ukraine whatever is going to bring peace as soon as possible. And we have to do in Yemen whatever is going to bring peace as soon as possible. I have always felt that when there is armed conflict, there are interest, economic and political interests at play that kind of make their business or their political life off that conflict. And I mean it for both sides of the conflict, even in a conflict in which one side is, is superior than the others. There's there's those who make their political life on it, and that's how they you know, that's how they gain their popularity through that conflict. And of course, there's also economic interest in conflict as well. This war in Ukraine, there's a line of thought that you could trace it going back years now with the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Um, Russia supporting one side, Ukraine on the other side. I, I, I mean, I believe the United States was pouring hundreds of millions at a minimum of weapons into Ukraine over, over this period of time that were also used in this conflict. Is this, I mean, is this something we could trace back that inevitably, if you feed war, if you, know, if you economically uh, provide the means for war, that it usually will result in a bigger war later down the road? Absolutely. I mean, there used to be a time when we would manufacture weapons to defend ourselves. I've seen so many instances where we manufacture conflict to sell weapons. And I think that it comes back to what we were talking about really early on in our conversation about this militarist mindset where we perceive the world through a military lens, where a situation like the Ukraine and Russia, let's stoke up the tensions. Let's not worry about the diplomatic solutions. Let's not take seriously concerns about the continued expansion of NATO ever eastward. Why should Russia be concerned about having American bases and American missiles right on its border? Let's just, let's just give the Ukraine weapons. And it's not as though the Ukraine didn't have weapons in the first instance. We should bear in mind that the Ukraine was the weapons factory of the former Soviet Union. So this is not a part of the world that is completely unused to huge amounts of military hardware. So a lot of our feeding of military, further military hardware into the region is actually making very explicit political points. And the rhetoric that went with that didn't help as well. And of course, there are people in the United States government today who have very close links to the Ukraine and have had 
for a number of years. So, of course, we have to ask ourselves the question. Whenever there is a conflict, we have to ask ourselves the question, did we do things that were responsible for causing that conflict? Did we do things that perhaps created greater tensions that made it more likely that there would be conflict? And unfortunately, when it comes to the United States of America in many parts of the world, the answer to that question is yes. And there is no doubt in my mind, the United States, the United Kingdom and European countries have not covered themselves in glory in the way that they have behaved in the Ukraine tension for many, many years now. The tension has been extremely volatile. It goes up and it goes down. We have done virtually nothing to try and ensure that there is a cap put on those tensions, that there are diplomatic processes that are adhered to that lead to solutions that will make conflict unnecessary. We had something called the Minsk Agreement. We had something called the Minsk II Agreement. And the reality is many sides to those agreements did not keep their side of the bargain. And what that has ultimately led to is Vladimir Putin violating those agreements completely and illegally invading Ukraine. But we cannot, as thinking human beings who care about human life, we cannot simply say it is wrong to look analytically at the reasons for a particular conflict and at the causes of that conflict. We also have to look at the Ukrainian political process, we do have a situation, however difficult it is for us to acknowledge, where President Zelensky has made alliances with some very strange, very reactionary groups in his own country. So we do have a situation where in the Ukrainian um, military, there is at least one militia, probably more, who are avowedly fascist and neo-Nazi. Now, that sort of situation does not in any way justify what Russia is doing in the Ukraine, but it does give us cause to think, should Zelensky have been doing some of the things that he has been doing? Could there be other ways that we could have been directing this ally of ours to try and resolve the issues that have ultimately led to this invasion and to this conflict. And again, let me repeat, this should in no way be seen as making excuses for Putin, because I think Putin has inherently done something that is evil and that is illegal. Russia is one of the few countries on the planet that I can't travel to to do my research because too many people in the country have warned me that given that I've written about Putin and his billions, I would simply be eliminated if I tried to travel to Russia. This is not someone I feel any sympathy or empathy towards. But at the same time, we've got to ask ourselves and our own allies the hard questions. And asking those hard questions does not in any way reduce or minimize the amount of empathy, sympathy, and support we feel for the people of the Ukraine. Andrew Feinstein, in your book, The Shadow World, you write about some history in, in the last hundred years or so, including how after World War I and the brutality that people saw during that war, how both the United States President Woodrow Wilson and British Prime Minister Lloyd George were both alarmed by the profit aspects to war. What happened there? There were brief attempts post World War II, so after nineteen eight sorry, post World War One, after nineteen eighteen, where many people in the world, including the leaders you mentioned, thought that this would be the war to end all wars. It was so brutal, it was so awful. Remember that this war was fought primarily by people in trenches running at each other, shooting at each other, bayonetting each other, hand-to-hand -hand combat, the throwing of, of very unsophisticated grenades into these trenches. It, 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 it was a truly awful, awful war that we should never forget. 
And there was quite correctly enormous outrage at the conclusion of that war. And as people came home and told the stories of that war, and a conference was held to attempt to change the nature of the world after that. We, of course, had the creation of the League of Nations, precursor to the United Nations. But we also had very real attempts to halt what was correctly described as war profiteering, private profiting from the suffering of so many in war. Now, this was always something of an an ambiguous project by some of the politicians. So, for instance, Lloyd George, one of his peace envoys to the Paris Peace Conference, was in fact himself an arms dealer, a gentleman by the name of Basil Zaharov. And by all accounts of the time, Zaharov spent his time at the peace conference trying to do everything to prevent peace because he had a material interest in it. And he was paying Lloyd George and other politicians vast bribes already then. So I'm not sure there was a total commitment to eliminating war profiteering, to eliminating war as far as we could. However, what got in the way even more than that was the rise of Hitler in Germany. And as there was a new specter of fascism that arose over Europe, So those who were leading the call to end war profiteering, who were leading a call to minimize the amount of weaponry that we had in the world and to ensure that it was only produced by governments for their own needs, came the need to rearm in the lead up to Hitler's Germany. And that really put paid to what was perhaps one of the most powerful peace movements the world has ever seen. And of course, we know what happened in the Second World War. The world we experienced immediately after the Second World War was a highly militarized world. And I would actually argue that it was in fact just before the Second World War that the sort of militarist mindset of which C. Wright Mills speaks really came to the fore in most so-called Western countries, the United States, Europe, and the United Kingdom. And I think we are suffering the consequences of that hyper-militarism still today. It was striking to me, we're down to our final minute here, but it was striking to me when you said that, or you talked about the role that defense contractors had in NATO expansion. And I think you said Vice President of Lockheed Martin served on uh, some commission or a committee to, to oversee? He chaired the committee to expand NATO. So he was tasked with negotiating with Eastern European countries about their accession to NATO. A senior vice president of Lockheed Martin, the biggest weapons maker on the planet. And this that is tells a- you everything you need to know. What, what kind of committee was this? So it was called the U.S. Committee to Expand NATO. This was a committee formed by the U.S. government and others. And the purpose of it was was to get consensus in the corridors of power for the accession of a variety of Eastern European states to NATO. But America clearly wanted to make sure that its defense contractors were at the forefront of those profiting from any expansion of NATO eastward. And Mitch, to be quite honest with you, if we are going to resolve the terrible situation in the Ukraine, both immediately and for the longer term, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and we're going to have to say to ourselves, was that expansion of NATO in any way sensible? Was our profiteering out of the expansion of NATO what was going to lead to the most secure and the safest Europe, not just for Europeans, but for Americans as well. Have we behaved in a way that is putting our safety, our national security at the front of the queue? And I'm not sure we have. Andrew Feinstein has been our guest. Again, Andrew Feinstein is the founding director of Shadow World Investigations. He's the author of the books, The Shadow World and After the Party. Andrew Feinstein, we look forward to your book and film about Yemen, and we'd certainly like to have you on once those come out. But I thank you for taking this time today. Thank you so much for having me.